Hey. Hi, Caleb. Good day. Session. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone and to some of our friends who are joining us for this workshop session on Internet Impact Assessment Tool in Action. And uh, we will be assessing the implications on the Nigerian social media bill and also having some conversation on the Nigerian Twitter ban, uh, which is also an offshoot of uh, this conversation. Um, we will be welcoming participants um, at the end of this conversation, uh, we will have some deep dive into people sharing their experiences and sharing their thoughts on this conversation. But before we start, um, we will be having our agenda, um, which will be starting with um, um, the introduction of um, the speakers, um, which, or rather the introduction that we're supposed to have um, with the Internet Toolkit Assessment, which will be taken by Zerenga Mabika, the Senior Policy Advisor um, of the Internet Society. Um, Internet Society. And uh, we'll also be having um, a project report from Emmanuel Ogu, um, who is the co-founder and president of uh, DEGOV. And um, yours truly, Kile um, Ogundele, will be speaking on some of the um, issues around the Nigerian Twitter ban, and uh, we'll have an open discussion with um, members who are, part, uh, are participating in this conversation. And uh, the most important thing is that we would like to uh, see that in this conversation, we are getting not just people talking about the problems, talking about the issues, but also giving us solutions uh, that can help us chat a way forward and we can have an actionable outcome um, that will be documented in the communique as well as to uh, have this included in the policy brief that we will be getting to pol uh, policymakers as well. So on this note, we welcome you to this session and um, I'd like to yield over to um, Berengai Mabika, the Senior Policy Advisor, Internet Society, uh, and, um, to have a conversation first on the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit. Thank you very much, um, Verengai. Thank you very much, uh, Caleb. I, I hope uh, you can hear me clearly. I'm in a public uh, space, so I hope that uh, I'm, I'm very clear. We hear you loud and clear. That's very good, Th thank you. And uh, greetings, colleagues. Um, wherever you are joining us from, we are very happy to have you uh, on this conversation on the Internet Impact Assessment uh, Toolkit. But importantly, a development that happened in the West African region, uh, I think that most of us are quite familiar with um, the, the Twitter ban in Nigeria. And we um, thought that uh, this discussion would sort of, you know, uh, uh, put into perspective some of the tools that we can use to analyze and probably, and most importantly, provide some kind of solutions to the challenges that we are having as the uh, community in um, uh, the internet community in, in West Africa. So I, I'm really um, happy to be here and uh, to be sharing with you some of the perspectives, especially from internet society perspective. So uh, Caleb, if you can allow me, let me just share uh, my screen. Let me share my screen and- uh, um, Tech, could you please make Verenda a co-host? Thank you. You can, you can share right now. Sure. Okay. Right away. I hope you can see my, my, my screen. Uh, please confirm. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, good. 
So uh, the, the, this presentation is probably just to get us into uh, the right frame for of discussion, especially uh, with uh, the developments that's happening in Nigeria, one of the major uh, powerhouses in Africa, but most importantly in West Africa, since this is the West African IGF. So um, we wanted to uh, to to uh, discuss the internet impact assessment to kit. Um, one of the uh, products that Internet Society developed last year and see and, and maybe try to see if it's something that we can use in our in our different environments for the different kind of developments that are happening things uh, that have an impact on the internet so the thinking behind the impact assessment toolkit really was just based on many other developments uh sorry about that there's a bit of uh, uh let me just uh, try to move away from this noise one moment uh, Caleb. Uh, hello, Caleb, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you loud and clear. Uh, uh, thanks. So, sorry about that disruption, colleagues. I'm, I'm in a public space and uh, I decided to take this call from here because uh, uh, I had an emergency that happened at, uh, at home. So uh, sorry about that um, confusion. So yeah, I was just saying, the thinking behind the environmental, I mean, the thinking behind the internet impact assessment is actually um, influenced or uh, motivated by some of the developments that we have seen before in our, in our global economy, especially the environmental impact assessment. I think, I think for people that are familiar with the environmental impact assessment, they would uh, uh, know that before any big project happens, whether it's a construction of a, a, a new town or a big, um, you know, local development plan or a mining uh, development, it is it is very important for us to undertake an environmental impact assessment because the are fundamental biodiversity issues that we should not disturb. So. Um, with the same thinking, uh, we uh, uh, last year we we, we decided to lo lo look at the internet in the same way, uh, going back a bit to the critical properties that makes the internet what it is today. So we know that many governments across the world, in different jurisdictions, they really want to take control of the internet, but in most of the cases, some of them are not even aware of these critical or fundamental properties that makes the internet what it is today. So the, the development of the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit was largely informed by uh, the need to protect those fundamental properties of the internet. So just to put into context, I think uh, like the developments that are currently happening in, uh, in Nigeria, governments, sometimes it's governments, sometimes it's even, uh, you know, businesses that are coming up with a very uh, a new rules uh, to the space that have the potential to impact the internet, like the core um, uh, properties of the internet. So, yeah, I, I think it is very important for us, especially people who are very much committed to the growth and the strength of the internet to, to push back on this, some of these developments. Um, on this slide, you see that there are many issues that are happening across the world. Some of them <clears throat> are not limited to Africa. Some are very pronounced in Africa, for example, the shutdowns. Um, I think Africa 
uh, he is the region with the most shutdowns uh, in the world today. Uh, every time we have an election in a particular country in Zimbabwe, in uh, Swaziland right now, uh, with confusion that's happening there, there was an internet shutdown. Um, in most of the countries, whenever a major event is about to happen, there's a likelihood of an internet shutdown. We also know that there are other developments uh, that are influenced by the, you know, these big fights by the big giants in the internet space, uh, private businesses from China or from the U US or from Europe that are fighting for space, fighting for customers. In some of these, you know, some of all these issues uh, might have an effect on the fundamental properties of the internet. And this is the reason why we, we really need to to uh, find ways to protect the fundamental properties of the internet. And possibly also before any development happens, try to, to find ways to do an assessment of the, the potential impact that a, a particular development might bring. I, I think with uh, COVID-19 uh, and um, I, I'm afraid to say just this morning I had uh, a very close, uh, I lost a close, very, a close family member to, to COVID. I, I think it's one uh, pandemic that has really uh, caused so much confusion in our society. But what we've also seen during the course of uh, uh, 2020 is that the internet was quite resilient in um, dealing with the situation of COVID. And uh, the reason why we had uh, a resilient internet during um, a very, uh, a, you know, a very negative uh, pandemic is simply because of some of the properties that I'm going to discuss briefly here with you. So um, the Internet Impact Assessment Toolkit is really uh, hinged on or it's it's uh, founded on the, these five critical properties of the internet. Uh, the five critical properties that we have called the five critical properties of the internet way of networking. And I'm going to briefly talk about uh, some of them. And uh, my uh, two colleagues, uh, Caleb and Emmanuel, are also going to share a bit and how they've tried to use this toolkit in addressing a particular development in their country. So one of the critical properties of the internet is the, that it is an accessible infrastructure with a common protocol. So I, I, I think we all agree that um, the only technical requirement that you need to go on the internet is the IP, the internet protocol. Um, and uh, this has been universal in in almost all the countries, while you are able to have the uh, the uh, the internet protocol, you can, you know, without permission from anyone, go on the internet and do develop any product of choice, or even interact uh, to the level of or with, with any kind of platform of your choice, without the need uh, for any for any permission from anyone. So uh, we believe that the internet protocol is it is is one of the key property of the internet and makes the internet what it is today and then secondly the um the internet uh, itself is a layered architecture of interoperable reusable building blocks by this we mean that the way the internet has been growing over the years uh, is that the 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 building blocks and the, 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 the standards development process has been very open. Uh, some of you might be familiar with the Internet Engineering Task Force, which is um, the organization which is very open, um, uh, which, which is uh, the organization that is mandated to develop most of the uh, the, the, the standards that we use on the internet uh, from transport to security, all the standards that are there on the internet and the development of this are not limited to a particular individual. If you think there's, a, uh, there's an innovation that you want to bring 
to security of the internet or to the transport layer of the internet or to any particular uh, protocol of the internet, you, you are anyone, any particular engineer is really free to, to do so. And we, we have seen um, uh, the growth of the internet and, and the resilience of the internet today uh, based on the, on the many standards that have been developed over the years. Um, the other important uh, element or property of the internet is the decentralized nature of the internet. I, I think this is of course hinged on the, the discussion that um, a centralized authority has got a single a point of failure. But because we do have decentralized autonomous systems of the internet, it makes the internet very resilient. If one particular network is down, it is, uh, you, you can reroute re or you can redirect your traffic to other um, management or other system, autonomous systems that are available in the world. And this makes it very resilient and, 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 and um, being able to stand all the pressures that comes from different um, uh, aspects of you know being managed from from a central point and i think this is very very important um and then the fourth uh, critical property is the uh, common global identifier system uh, some of you again may be familiar with the domain name system which allows um which allows for which allows to create spaces that suit the need and specific applications um, and uh, consistent mapping, uh, which of course achieves universality and predictability of of, of the internet. So we we, we believe that um, um, we, with the common addressing uh, a, a space uh, that you know the internet is uh, is supported from from uh, makes it very unique and very resilient to support you know. Uh, common addressing um, and and, um, and 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 the numbering system that makes it e um, easy to for anyone from anywhere to be able to connect to the uh, to to uh, to the network uh, to the network of networks. And uh, lastly. E the last critical property of the internet is uh, the general purpose network. So the internet, if you go back to history, you probably find that the internet was designed as a general purpose network. It wasn't really designed for a particular use case. And we have seen over the years that uh, various things, have, uh, various innovations um, have developed on top of the internet protocol, things that we never knew would come. I think initially in the old days, uh, what used to define the internet was mostly the email. And I remember at some point when I was still in college, I had like 20 or 30 email accounts because that was the in thing, uh, you know, to be, to have several email addresses, giving people different email addresses was the in thing. But over the years, we are seeing that the internet uh, is really general purpose. It serves many, many, many other use cases. Now we see uh, the power of the internet in the banking sector. We see the power of the internet in the real estate industry, in the entertainment industry, in um, social media. And today we talk of TikTok. Just a few years back, there, there was the, the, the in thing was WhatsApp. Just a few years back, the in thing was Facebook. Just in, you know, all, all, all these things, gaming is is is, is becoming one. So, the internet is really general purpose, and any idea that comes that could be supported by the internet really would find space. So, this is very important for uh, the permissionless innovation, and uh, of course, um, the many innovations that uh, we we keep on encouraging. Um, new users on the internet to to explore. So uh, we believe that these are the five critical properties that that makes the internet what it is today. And any development in any country um, 
if it, it threatens to uh, to have an impact or an effect on any of these uh, properties, there's a big likelihood that you will have very negative consequences or sometimes even unintended consequences, uh, things that you would not even know would happen generally because you would have, um, you know, affected one of, of, of the critical properties of the internet. So the internet uh, impact assessment toolkit is really hinged on on, 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 on the understanding that um, he, when a particular development is happening, happening in the country or globally, uh, the toolkit should be able to help the policymakers or users of the internet to analyze how those decisions could impact the internet. And we believe that any development that still safeguards or protect these fundamental crit critical properties could aid to the growth of the internet. And if it affects uh, any of the properties negatively, there's a big likelihood that you'll have negative consequences on the, on the internet. So generally speaking, the internet impact assessment toolkit is really um, a tool that we developed at ISO to, to be able to help policymakers, technologists, to be able to uh, analyze those five critical properties and it comes with additional uh, uh, things such as the use cases that you can use so um, if there's a particular the toolkit itself provides some particular use cases that have been tried uh, and that have been tested before in other jurisdictions so we, for example if a shutdown is happening we are likely to know that uh, uh, it might have particular economic implications or social implications or even you know um technical implications to the internet so uh, the toolkit itself comes with those with, with those um with, with um uh those uh use cases um so we, some of you might be thinking that probably internet society is not is not uh, uh supportive of the regulation that happens on the internet, uh, not necessarily. We really support um, policymakers, decision makers, private businesses, and many other to, to make any policies that applies to their business. But what we believe is that they should just um, pause a bit before they make any of those decisions and look at the Im potential impact of those decisions on the critical properties of the internet. So uh, this is basically just to put us in, into, uh, into perspective and uh, uh, to frame the discussion more uh, uh, in line with what my colleagues will talk about. I, I think, uh, Caleb, let me stop here and then uh, you give uh, other colleagues um, an opportunity to, to speak. Thank you. Thank you very much, Verengai, and um, we want to um, thank you for sharing some of those thoughts with us. And in the event that you are just joining this conversation, we are having a conversation on the impact assessment tool in action, um, which is um, one of the tools that was um, used by um, their gov in collaboration with Internet Society. Um, to carry out some um, research and the project will be presented shortly. Um, let me um, quickly introduce to you the next person who will be speaking um, during this conversation um, is Emmanuel Ogo, um, PhD. Um, he teaches at um, the Babcock University and is also a researcher. And I'm glad to share with you that um, we've collaborated with them and we've seen lots of impact uh, in some of the conversations that we've had. And um, some of those research work will be presented shortly. So um, please permit me to welcome um, Emmanuel Ogu, um, who will be sharing some of the, um, the impact assessment tool conversation that we are going to be having uh, right away. Manuel, over to you. 
Thank you, Kilo. Good afternoon uh, from Nigeria. Everyone, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you loud and clear. All right, thank you. So um, I'm Emmanuel, and um, I'll be talking to you briefly about a research project that um, is ongoing um, in collaboration between the Dear Government Organization and the Internet Society. The Dear Government Organization, or Dear Govs for short, is a youth-led intervention against um, the regulatory, the sites of regulatory impropriety by governments um, who seek to consolidate interests around the world using regulations and various forms of legislation in ways that threaten the, the utility of the internet for other stakeholders in the global internet space. And then um, we have recently began to look at um, how the Internet Impact Assessment took it, which Berengai shared about a few moments ago, how we can apply this to um, accessing the impact of regulations around the world. Um, and we began in December 2020 to work on the um, toolkit and then apply it to a law in Nigeria, um, the social media bill, proposed social media law in Nigeria, which was um, proposed or initiated in November 2019. So in for the next few minutes, I'll be just I'll just be sharing with you um, insights about um, this bill and how it um, has and how our findings have related to or findings in regards to how this bill works um, in, in, with respect to the internet impact assessment took it. I would post in the chat in a few minutes, the link to the project online so that you could um, check it out and um, possibly provide your feedback and thoughts on the project and what we have done so far. Uh, just a second uh, while I post that link in the chat right now. Copy in, control C. Uh, Hello, Emmanuel, would you want to take over the slide? Okay. So you can present from your end. Um, okay, um, yeah, but I'm on a low bandwidth connection. I don't know that would be Okay, so don't worry, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll try. I'll, if you can't, I'll, I will support yeah. you from here. Thank you. Yeah, if, if, if you can just, yeah, I'll just tell you when to move to the next one, thank you. Okay, uh, sorry. Yeah, my connection is delaying a little bit, but I to come up in a few seconds right now. Uh, the link to the project. Okay. Yeah, so while I wait for that to come up, I would um, begin with um, presenting the background of the research we um, undertook. So in the November 2019, the Protection from Internet Falsehoods and Manipulation Bill was proposed uh, by a Senator of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Um, but then we, we have seen between this time and now how this bill has um, been fiercely resisted with much opposition, particularly from civil society um, organizations, both within Nigeria and across the world, uh, particularly with respect to the fact that it gives um, the government of the Federal Republic of Nigeria almost um, you know, exclusive and um, unilateral control um, over the internet space in Nigeria. Okay, I've put the link in the chat now, over the internet space in Nigeria, and then um, permitting them to shut down the internet at will, um, and then, you know, prosecute um, individuals for things that they say and do on the internet. Now, um, under the hashtag say no to social media bills or anti-social media bill, we have seen um, much public outcry on various social media against this bill. Um, on Twitter, on um, Facebook, and um, on LinkedIn, we have heard various voices come up to share about this, um, um, the, the, the critical points of this bill and how they threaten the, the visions for a sustainable future for the internet space in Nigeria. The Human Rights Watch this, this described the bill as a disturbing trend towards repression of freedom of expression in Nigeria that would have made the death penalty a possible punishment for hate speech. 
Amnesty International um, also described the bill as an alarming escalation in the authorities, referring to the Nigerian government's attempts to censor and punish social media users for freely expressing their opinion and giving these authorities arbitrary powers to shut down the internet and limit access to social media and make criticizing the government punishable with life imprisonment and the death penalty. Indeed, uh, much, re um, much revisions have gone into the bill but still in its current form, there has been many challenges and many, many fault lines that um, threaten the internet, sustainability of the internet in Nigeria. And as a matter of fact, we have already begun to see um, some of the implications of these, um, what this bill can cause playing out in Nigeria at the moment. Um, Varenga mentioned about the recent Twitter ban that Nigeria is currently experiencing. Um, and these are just um, some of the telltales of what these, a law like this in the hands of, um, you know, authorities can actually bring about in a democratic society. Next slide, please, Caleb. Okay, so um, although we have on record, uh, an unsuccessful attempt at enacting similar legislation in 2015 Hello. under a bill that was titled Hello. the frivolous yeah okay titled the frivolous petitions bill but then we see that much of what has been um what was contained in that bill which was resisted at the time and you know the government was forced to drop that um, proposal was successfully couched under the Cybercrime Act, which was passed into law in the same year in 2015. But generally, um, what the social media bill uh, intends to do, you know, in its current proposition, is to prevent the transmission of false statements of fact in Nigeria, um, whether it's perpetuated by an individual person or a non-individual entity or corporate um, organization. Um, it it tries to give the government leeways to to um, undertake counter actions. And um, of course, initiate consequences or tackle consequences of such transmissions. Um, you know, the aim is also to destabilize funding and promotion of online locations, which could range from user account to websites to platforms and other internet sources. And you know, get them to um, or get the government help the government to establish measures for detecting, controlling, and protecting against supposed bad behavior, um, very loosely and broadly defined if at all, that could be propagated by such online locations. And this was the general intention of the bill. Um, next slide, please, Caleb. Okay, we also saw that the bill, or we, we also saw, yeah, that the bill um, seeks to improve disclosure of information regarding content that is sponsored for political purposes, um, also help the government to, um, Establish penalties and for sanctioning uh, categories of offenders across various levels of various um, manners of engagement. More specifically, we also see that the bill um, tries to help the government to regulate actions and um, some of the responses of internet intermediaries, including mass media service providers, with regards to online locations that they see to be in contravention of various provisions of the bill. Um, however, some of the specific regulatory provisions that we have seen in this bill, um, in the document documentation of this bill, is um, has been seen to be quite harmful or to threaten the internet web networking and the five critical properties, which Verengai had um, presented about a few minutes ago. Um, next slide, please, Caleb. All right, so. Um, in, in the first part of our analysis, we, 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 we are putting two parts of this bill together, part five, section 27, subsection three and four of the bill, um, side by side with part four, section 17 and 18. Um, there are two regulations or there are two um, issues that arise from these um, parts of the bill in their current uh, composition or in their current um, and what they contain currently. The first part, which is the part on the left, part five, section 27, um, specifies that an online location can be banned or flagged for repeatedly contravening specific provisions of the bill you know, for some time. And then um, of course, as a result, when such an online location is flagged using the word in the bill declared as a violating um, location, 
individuals who, are, who attempt to access this online location via the URL of the location would be instead um, met with a message or prevented from accessing that location and instead redirected to um, somewhere else. Um, and also every other every other location online that mirrors or maps this online location either by way of resharing retweeting or referring you know would also have this declaration um, as this bill tends to specify and then there is also the one on the right which is part four section 17 and 18 which specifies a targeted correction regulation which is instituted against an internet intermediary um, that mandates them to transmit a declaration that whatever is um, found on an online location that has been flagged is actually false information. And then uh, users who are trying to access this location would be met with this message. And there is the disabling regulation as well, which mandates inter internet intermediaries to disable access to such internet um, locations. And uh, you know, all is copies, identical copies of that location and then transmit a correction notice to end users. Next um, slide, please, Caleb, where we discuss about um, the implications of this bill. Okay, so we see that this bill threatens two critical properties of the internet, which is critical property four, dealing with common global identifiers, and critical property two, dealing with open um, the open architecture of interoperable and reusable building blocks. With respect to critical property four, we see that in implementing these provisions, uh, users who intend to visit an online location that has been declared as supposedly false or as supposedly um, affected by this bill would end up on another location or, or end up at a destination other than that which they had intended to be on just because um, just by virtue of being Nigerian as it were and because the unique identifier that maps to that intended location have been tampered with and then there's critical property two which um, also um, identifies the fact that for a notice like that to be posted in such a way that it's visible to only selected demographic of end users, which are Nigerians, as it were, we need to establish some form of filtering in place to categorize users who try to access a location as allowed or disallowed. And because um, IP addresses are often invisible to service providers, this operation is likely to result in a, in a situation we refer to technically as overblocking. Overblocking is a situation wherein uh, more sources are blocked than, than we actually intended to be blocked. Um, and also we see that the security and performance functions of the internet domain system could be affected by this operation as well. So this is the first part of the analysis. Next slide, please. In the second part of the analysis, we put um, side by side again two other aspects of the regulation, part five, section 28, and then part four, section 23. So under part five, section 28, we see that an um, enforcement agency would issue an access blocking order against a declared online location that is seen to be in continued contravention of the terms of a declaration that has been issued against it, including failing to prevent access to content that is you know, um, published on that location for end users in Nigeria. Or in other words, um, an online location that is found to be in repeated violation of you know, this part of the bill will be subject to an access blocking order. And this order will be issued by Nigeria's Communication Commission to the internet service provider. And then on the other hand, we see an access, an access locking order, which functions in a similar way to the access blocking order, um, except that in this case, um, the, the access locking order is issued to the uh, Nigerian Communications Commission to order an internet service internet intermediary to take responsible, reasonable steps to disable access to an online location. So um, the access locking order is supposed to precede the access blocking order. So wherein a, an internet intermediary or mass service provider fails to take actions um, as specified in an access locking order pertaining an uh, the declared online location, we see that um, Part five, section 28 allows um, the law enforcement agency to issue a blocking order against such an online location. And then in the next slide, um, we see that this affects um, critical property four. Next slide, please, Caleb. Mm. 
Okay. Yeah, we see that it affects critical property four um, and potentially critical property three um, with respect to the fact that in order to effectively block access in the manner in which the regulatory um, provisions specify, there has to be content filtering again to isolate or segregate packets based on global identifiers with respect to a particular location, in this case, Nigeria. And then what is done with these pack packets next could potentially affect uh, critical property three. Because in practice, when um, you block access to an online location and then you filter the traffic, um, one of two things will be done. It's either this traffic or packets are redirected to an online, another destination, or they are dropped all together. And then, um, you know, this could have a potential impact on critical property three of the internet, which relates to um, the decentralized management and distributed routing system of the internet. By virtue of the fact that um, routing decisions would no longer be based on optimization on the optimized functions of the internet, um, internet domain name system, but rather it would be based on what the specifications of the regulations are, and then high costs of internet um, access could also result because internet um, packets could be routed through longer destinations than they would otherwise have had to pass through without such regulatory provisions. Um, next slide, please. There are also some emerging governance issues that um, also emanated from the specifications of these regulatory provisions as contained in the social media bill, Nigeria social media bill. Who decides what is false on the internet or in public space? You know, is it sufficient that a government authority um, perceives that something is false simply because it does not serve the interests of the incumbent government at the time or the perceived interest of the country as viewed through the lens of whatever the political interest of the incumbent government is as against having to um, open up such such viewpoints to wider multi-stakeholder engagement across the system of the, or the democratic system of the country. And then we also see um, a question of concern about who should be responsible for enforcing internet related regulations. Um, in the context of the of Nigeria social media bill, the Nigerian police force is empowered exclusively with the authority to enforce this bill. Now there is the, there is the concern about the technical capability of the Nigerian police force to deal with the realities of, uh, of a law um, like this and um, you know what, what it could bring about, what could be the um, offspring or manifestation of this law across various points. And then we also see that, um, of course, you know, the technical intricacies of how it will be enforced are also lacking with respect to the fact that um, the, the, the bill does not seem to have taken into cognizance what some of the technical um, intricacies or implications of enforcing some of the provisions of the bill would actually entail. Of course, this, this also suggests that the technical community might not have been carried along in, in referring to these or within drafting or crafting these proposed legislation. But then there's also the, the concern of, um, with respect to um, governance issue, the second governance issue raised, um, who's responsible for enforcing internet related regulations. Would an organization or would a government agency, should it have the autonomy of declaring a, a, a certain internet content as false or in violation just by virtue of the provisions of this bill? or would there be or shouldn't there be need for an independent ombudsmanship to help to buffer such a declaration or such a, uh, an allegation to scrutinize and, inf and, and investigate that these are not rogue politically motivated in situations like has been the case even currently in Nigeria and you know across various other aspects or various countries of the world. So these are the um, this is a brief wrap up of the uh, composition of this um, research. Um, you can find more information in the link I posted earlier, which I'm going to post now again for those who may have just joined the call, um, the, the session. So um, you can check that out, check out the full version of the report, and then share your thoughts and comments, and we'll be glad to engage further. Thank you. I yield the floor back to Caleb. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, for sharing those uh, clear thoughts um, on the research work done. Um, without wasting much of your time, um, I will, although I'm moderating this session, I will be talking about um, the state of affairs of Twitter ban and just give you guys um, 
um, just a quick overview of what um, the Twitter ban is all about. So um, while that is on, I'd like um, for, I'd like um, Francis to please share his screen. Thank you. I was supposed to speak, yeah, but yes, I can go. <laughs> um who was that okay thank you so um i will be talking about the current affair issues on what exactly is happening um with the twitter ban in nigeria uh so as of today um it's been 53 days since the twitter ban in nigeria um 53 days nine hours and approximately about 52 seconds um, to the time I'm speaking. Um, this timing was done based on the fact that we are taking note of what is currently happening um, at the Internet Society Nigerian chapter. Um, that being said, uh, we've taken note of some of the issues that could have caused a uh, code for the Twitter ban um, that we are having in Nigeria. More importantly, uh, we are reviewing what the economic cost is to Nigeria. As of today, um, given that we have about 53 days uh, and nine hours into that Twitter band, Nigeria has approximately uh, lost about 321 million US dollars um, in monetary value or economic value. Um, this data was actually uh, collected from the uh, cost of internet shutdown tool, uh, which was developed by NetBlocks, um, NetBlocks uh, which does a um, lot of mapping on internet um, online freedom. And at Internet Society, we strongly believe in the freedom of internet and the fact that people should have that ability to be able to express themselves digitally and do whatever they want, um, although with some form of regulation. So um, just to make this conversation a bit more interactive, um, I will be yielding the floor in about two minutes after this conversation. And um, after this conversation, so that we can have quite a number of people contribute to this conversation. So first of all, um, I'd like to welcome, um, I'd like to welcome, um, Ajilola Abdul Akim Ajilola to just have uh, give us some thoughts of his um, based on what he thinks about the Twitter ban in Nigeria, given that he is the chairman um, of the cybersecurity. I'm putting you on the spot, Abdul. Yes, Akim. you are. <laughs> yes, um, he's the chairman. Okay. Is the chairman um, cybersecurity, and these guys are <laughs> close to the government. So we'd like to hear your insider view of what you think the Twitter ban vis-a-vis uh, -vis the earlier conversation we've had on um, the internet impact assessment tool. Okay, I don't know if I'm necessarily that close to government, uh, but I, 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 I do get called by them for some inputs and advice, and it's not all battles that you, you win. Uh, very quickly, first of all, um, the internet is controlled. Uh, it's just not controlled by us. Uh, arguably, you know, companies that are based in Southern California with their own standards, perceptions, uh, legislation, and who answer to their shareholders first and foremost, do control these um, uh, media. Um, uh, as Donald Trump has found out much to his chagrin, uh, he doesn't have control of Facebook, and neither does he have control of Twitter, for example. Uh, also, uh, I just like to clear up uh, a misconception. Cyberspace does have uh, certain um, boundaries for certain groups of people. Uh, primarily, those boundaries are articulated by jurisdiction, so that even though bad actors have quote unquote no boundaries, um, the law enforcement, you know, you can't just go to Ghana and in interrogate the machine there. Having said that, uh, you know, the internet is really like a road. Uh, it is agnostic and uh, it really it doesn't care what the content is. And I think that's where part of the misunderstanding has come that um, especially government is concerned and partly because of feedback from people 
like you and I about, about content. Um, but also very interestingly, internet uh, facilitates disruption. Uh, it upsets, often upsets the status quo, innovation. So disruption by itself is not necessarily uh, a bad thing. Uh, but one of the areas that has been of concern, and again, for me, there's a slight difference between the internet itself and some of the, plat the social media platforms on the internet. Um, there has been significant rise in what we would call abuse. Now, interestingly, this abuse can be by, from government itself. Uh, also, as we know, it can be from bad actors and certainly uh, by, by you know, users. Now, on the government side, um, when we look at governments, we have to be concerned. First of all, governments are not always very open. And this is you know, the other end of a spectrum that I think Varangai talked about in terms of the openness of the internet. Uh, governments by nature are centralized and love control. Again, this is at variance with the philosophy of the internet, which is uh, quite decentralized and minimal control of any single person, entity, or equipment so that you don't have single points of failure. Uh, governments love stability and the status quo. Now, the internet does love st stability, but it has no qualms about upsetting the status quo. Um, also, what we are finding in this era is that um, non-government uh, actors, especially the private sector, I mentioned Facebook and Twitter, really uh, are challenging, significantly challenging, government monopoly on power and control. And so uh, control is, uh, you know, also control of the internet by government is actually part of a bigger trend we're seeing across the world, especially with these, uh, the rise of what we call, in some cases, populist or fascist uh, uh, administrations uh, we've seen in some countries around the world. Uh, and it, it's an unfortunate global trend that we are worried about. So the question then arises is, uh, you know, what's the way forward? Well, first and foremost, we have to understand that government needs to be checked by the judiciary. And some of the issues that Emmanuel Ogu raised are really of great concern. Uh, I think we have to be very careful that a legislation, as he correctly said, does not simply assign some agency, which by the way is de facto executive, to simply just determine whether something is right or wrong, but especially whether to block or to lock. I think it must also, we must bring in the judiciary in this process so that we do need some level of control, but it has to be based on what I would call democratic norms. So specifically on some uh, suggestions on the way forward. First of all, we must consider our discussions and engagement as a journey, not a destination. New things will always come up, new angst, new challenges. So we, the, the, but the discussion must always be continuous. It must be respectful, uh, both by the government, but by civil society and the private sector. Um, so all sides you know, need to be very respectful in how we interact with each other. Uh, we also need to ensure that we have continuous education, especially of strategic decision makers, such as our legislatures. Because sometimes some of these, uh, the content of some of these bills is based on either a misunderstanding or, you know, with due respect, uh, ig ignorance, uh, plain and simple, uh, on, on the part of some of our legislatures and some of our high level decision makers. So we need to be able to achieve, like I said, it's a journey, achieve a dynamic balance. And then uh, one of the key things I think we need to do is to establish norms uh, based on multi-stakeholder engagement and consensus where possible. So in conclusion, two things. One, we need to make sure that we practice eternal vigilance. We must always be on the watch. The second thing we need to do is frankly to create a pipeline of activists so that when people like Kalev get a bit old or uh, Dr. Ugu get a bit old, there's a new generation to take over. On that note, thank you very much.
Hello. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Sorry. Thank you very much, um, Abdullahi Machulala. And um, you've shared some clear thoughts on um, the issues of um, education, specifically for the policymakers. And for me, I personally have, to, I do have some concerns when it comes to issues around how the Nigerian police, who is, or rather who has been known for lots of abuses, um, um, specifically on um, human rights abuses, specifically for those who are just having a computer, carrying a computer along, along the road, specifically the youths, um, how they will interpret this same uh, um, uh, bill when eventually it is passed to law, but we do hope it is not passed to law, how they will interpret it, and specifically how the judiciary themselves will also um, interpret um, how they will pass judgment on issues surrounding um, 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 these cases. However, um, it is not specifically for me to say what the government will do or what the government won't do, uh, but I'd like to just bring forward um, a couple of few persons um, of interest who are also experts in this field to share some of their thoughts as well. So I'm um, bringing um, forward um, Dr. Ukola Faturoti, um, who is a researcher as well and um, um, based in the UK, uh, to share some of his line of thoughts about the Twitter ban and vis-a-vis -vis, um, the conversation around the Internet Impact Assessment Tool. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caleb. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this is Bukola speaking to you from uh, Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, yes, uh, that's, uh, let me start with the presentation, especially the areas analyzed by Emmanuel. Very fantastic, and I really, really enjoyed it because it actually addresses the issues which are being ignored, then I will also build on what uh, Mr. or if you allow me to call you uh, Alaji, that is uh, Mr. Abdul Akim Ajijola. As in, uh, uh, initially when you were being introduced by Caleb, you said, okay, uh, maybe you're working for the government or they do consult you. But based on the analysis that you've given and what is obtainable uh, in Nigeria, I doubt if they're listening to you uh, at all, because you've uh, highlighted the key issues. And uh, I will just uh, address one part. Uh, is the Nigerian government right in uh, regulating the internet? Yes. But how the internet is being regulated, that is the issue. Uh, if you look at the idea of trying to shut down uh, Twitter or even the internet as a whole, is becoming a regular practice in Africa, as in Ethiopia also uh, did the same thing. There was a similar experience there in Sudan. And rather than the government to actually be looking at how the internet has even helped in their own responsibilities. If you look at the digital economy in Nigeria, the internet, the social media, uh, the e-commerce platforms, they've been able to remove a lot of uh, barriers to uh, market entry. And rather than, okay, also in Uganda, there, there's also a similar uh, approach. So the, the government actually ignored that area. And it's like you are trying to throw away the baby uh, and the bath water, as we like to say. So that, that is one very big mistake. And the other thing which I will uh, point out, if you look at UK, for example, there, there is online uh, arm uh, bill, which the government has put in place because we know that all these things exist, but they doing it the right way is what we actually uh, don't have. Somebody like, look at the three uh, black players, uh, in the uh, English national team, they were subjected to racism and the internet was not shut down because uh, of that, or maybe Twitter. The question was always telling uh, the social media platforms uh, to actually do more, which they're actually trying. Though my position in respect of that is that we should focus on the people rather than the, uh, the platform uh, itself, because if, 
if people in the society, if they're doing the right thing, I don't think we're going to have that problem. And finally, so that I can yield the floor to other people, uh, based on what uh, Mr. Gijola said, you can actually see that there is stark ignorance, stark insincerity of purpose on behalf of lawmakers. I'm not trying to make this thing political. I I've done research as in into e-commerce platforms in Nigeria, the regulation of intermediaries. And if you read some of the bills that are being put together, it's just like somebody woke up from the bar, I mean, from a pub and quickly drafted something together. Oh, I must submit something. The bill were not, these bills were not thought through at all. I, I, I won't mention names, but somebody submitted a bill that never saw the light of the day in the first uh, republic. This is during uh, President uh, Obasan just tenure. That bill never went through. Guess what another person did? Another person three years after drafted the same bill, which was incoherently and haphazardly drafted. So because unfortunately, we have people in government even who do not have the necessary legislative etiquette. So if you don't study, if you don't actually bring people with expertise on board, uh, you will not get the law right. So in summary, the government is right to put a boundary in place as we talk about cyber anarchy uh, and there must be a cyber order, but the way the Nigerian government has gone about it is totally and outrightly wrong. And if they continue like that, they're not just going to only stifle a freedom of expression, they're actually going to destroy the creativity behind all those social, uh, social media platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pukola Faturoti. You have shared um, quite um, a number of perspectives uh, specifically when you mentioned that um, some of these issues stifle innovation and uh, as well as poor drafting of the law uh, or the bills that are, are being passed um, across the executive as well. Um, um, not to take much of our time, I'd like to also welcome um, one other person uh, to share a perspective, um, we need to balance the gender here. So I am welcoming um, Dr. Nina Ifeanyi Adjufo, who is also a researcher. I think she is based in South Africa, if my memory serves me right, uh, to also share some of her perspective on what she thinks about the Twitter ban vis-a-vis -vis the internet impact assessment tool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Caleb. I'm actually in Swansea. I'm a lecturer at Swansea, so greetings from Swansea. Um, Abdul Hakim has said everything pertinent, and it's good to hear Bukola's perspective as well. Bukola was my lecturer, actually. So, and I agree absolutely that what is happening is practically to so much lack of ignorance. But I want to come in from a different perspective. I spoke unequivocally about the fact that Nigeria was in a position of breaching fundamental human rights. Um, like Kajijala says, we need to find a balance as well. Increasingly under the international law system, social media platforms are being considered as actors in conflict situations. So in terms of conflict under international law systems, the social media platforms are now increasingly being seen as conflict parties. You know, just the way you would also have state. Just, just the way you would have state actors and non-state actors. So um, you find that there are various common features of, um, you know, there are common features of conflict happening on social media platforms, data breaches, information leaks, misinformation, um, disruptive activities going on, critical internet resources being controlled by social media infrastructure sabotage. So um, like they've both said, the state government is in the right place to take a decision. Because absolutely, when you talk about national security, unfortunately, it has become a non-justiciable plea by government. And when that happens, you know, every consideration otherwise will be given no priority at all. So 
but it's important that we find that um, balance and it must be on a basis and i will speak basically from that consideration in terms of even where a state perceives a conflict situation there has to be a basis of necessity and proportionality and what has happened i've retreated so many times is nothing necessary and proportional in terms of what has happened we must be careful the decisions we take <clears throat> and i know because this is going to be um, reported, it is important that we begin to push again for the digital rights bill. It was not signed in 2019. I think this is the time to move for a digital rights act in Nigeria. Like Bukola said, Nigeria has to start thinking about expertise in terms of how we propagate policies, how we propagate legislation. Some few years back, if you had picked up the data protection bill, it was word for word unabridged the UK data protection law. Thankfully, a new bill is being submitted. So it is important that these tensions are absolutely a breach of fundamental human rights, absolutely, because if you weigh it from a basis of necessity and proportionality, there is absolutely a breach of the right to freedom of information right now. And Nigeria must see that it restores, not just on the basis of freedom of information, rights are always interrelated social and economic rights are also related to civil and political rights so that when you breach a right to freedom of information you also disrupt economic activities for people so it's important that we re-emphasize or re-evaluate the decision that is being taken and we make sure that national policies do not endanger human rights another thing that is important to note is that cross-border data flow is very important in terms of digital cooperation and so such a move by Nigeria banning Twitter can also trigger fragmentation of network. It can silence critical stakeholders. It can silence civil society organizations who speak out for rights. It can even silence law enforcement, which is what they may not realize. It has a ripple effect. It will stifle Nigeria's um, interest and at the same time stifle interest of citizens. And it's important we also make sure that online abuses do not lead to offline abuses. So when you prevent people from speaking on the internet, you also prevent them from exercising other fundamental rights offline. So I am all for, I, it was disheartening listening to Emmanuel's presentation, really, to think that Nigeria will go in that way. But I absolutely agree with Ajijola's points and also Bukola's points. We need to reevaluate and take our place in propagating human rights in the digital age rather than stifling. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nina. Uh, we will definitely be coming back to um, most of our contributors um, to perhaps speak on, um, around the African Charter on Human Rights that also supports um, speaking against um, the uh, Twitter ban. However, uh, just to move forward in this conversation, I'd like to um, invite someone I have so much respect for um, who happens to be um, the chair of the West African um, Internet Governance Forum, and who also doubles as a Nigerian and has probably experienced the Twitter ban herself to perhaps share some of our line of thoughts and um, share our experience. Please welcome with me, um, Madam Mary Uduma to share our thoughts, after which uh, we will be bringing on um, a dear friend from um, Affordance for A4AI. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Caleb, for having me to make one or two interventions. Um, I'm happy that um, we are not only looking at the, the human rights aspect, there are economic aspects of it. Somebody has talked about that. And uh, we know that our young people are are, are really um, um, latching on, on to what um, uh, they can uh, make use of the, uh, uh, on the Twitter uh, platform to be able to do, express themselves, not only expressing themselves, they will be able to do some business. However, um, um, it might not be well thought, of, thought out, but the truth is that just like Ajibola said, and Nena has said, we need to balance. Balance in the fact that, see, government, after all, we human rights activists, when we say government put standards into place, do this, do that, they, it is only government that can enforce the, the, the 
human rights activists, the civil society, we cannot, we cannot enforce anything. However, as Nena said to us during the West African, Internet, um, West African School of, on Internet Governance, he said there should be a multi stakeholder conversation. So if uh, Internet society can galvanize others, or the IGF, for instance, the Nigerian IGF, will gal galvanize other um, civil society um, activists uh, or, or organizations to come up with reasons, cogent ones, um, well articulated and sent into the government. I, I mean, most time they will listen, even though they may not take our advice, our recommendation, but in one way or the other, would have done our own bit. So the responsibility is left for us to be able to get ourselves organized. Government is always very, 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 um, very, very uh, concerned about who is uh, the civil society, who pro propagates human rights uh, issues. So we have to get ourselves organized. So we share our own responsibility there. As others have said, a lot of research needs to be done. A lot of talking to, a lot of lobbying. In the US, people lobby. Why do they lobby? They lobby because they want their, 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 their views to be taken into consideration at, at the legislative level. So as uh, civil society organizations, we may also look at lobbying so that when such things are coming up, we'll be able to see how it happens. I'm not a fan of, I don't use so much, so, so much on Twitter, but I get a lot of information from them. So. Two things I've said, one, we have our own responsibility. Even as we move, we, we demand rights, we have our own responsibility. We have to share our own responsibility by getting ourselves well organized. I like the bill that is being proposed, but who and who are supporting the bill, that's important. On the other hand, we need to, to help government. We can do it. People like Ajibola, uh, um, uh, uh, Akim, Akim has access to the government. I, I think if we have likes of Akim to speak to government or, or, uh, uh, establishment, they will listen to him. So those are things, let's leverage on such and do lobbying. Let's start lobbying. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much, uh, Madam Uduma. And um, would like to bring forward um, Madam Onika, uh, Onik, um, sorry, Madam Onika to uh, please share some of our thoughts from um, what she thinks as um, from the perspective, maybe from the perspective of A4AI or, AI, or pr probably our own personal perspective. And then we do a round trip to other members of um, the community who are currently um, in this conversation to um, make their intervention. Monica, over to you. Uh, yes, I'm sorry uh, about that delay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for this opportunity. So, um, I mean, several things have been raised that are quite pertinent, and I, I would not want to necessarily repeat them. But I, I, one of the things that I really want us to emphasize is this uh, notion of a rights-based framework. Uh, and I think Nana I spoke to that so beautifully, uh, the importance of understanding that uh, we have to preserve rights, uh, digital rights online, as well as offline, and that there's definitely uh, an interaction and interrelation between the two. The uh, coalitions, coalition in Nigeria uh, a few years ago made some submissions to the uh, digital uh, rights uh, framework that the government was actually um, developing. And I think that it's time for us, and I, I'm really grateful for that reminder, that we need to go back to sort of the drawing board and, and look at how are we making sure that, um, you know, our access uh, does not uh, also trample upon other people's rights, but also that we preserve the rights of those uh, who are online. A, a social media ban is, is a bit of a clumsy way of uh, regulating 
uh, the internet or even content, uh, quite frankly. And I think that uh, we need a more proactive uh, uh, way to be able to, to do that. I mean, that's what the regulatory body exists uh, to do, uh, is, is to regulate the, the internet. So, uh, you know, I think that we, we have an opportunity to be proactive, especially given this experience um, of uh, being offline, uh, of Twitter rather, uh, for as long as we have it and the financial cost i believe uh, a couple of days ago i read it was at about 240 uh three million uh dollars uh so far so it's really um not uh you know in the right direction especially if we want to build uh, a digital economy and you know a digital flow that uh is inclusive of everyone uh so i, I think that would be my submission that you know, just highlighting the fact that digital rights are just as important uh, and we need to, to go back to engaging, especially civil society. It's really unfortunate that we don't have enough uh, that are engaged, but we, we really need to uh, understand that people have a right to an internet, that this is ecosystem that is healthy and a healthy system is one that also protects their, protects their rights as well, offline and online. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica, for um, your perspective on on uh, on this conversation. Um, I'd like to make this um, um, conversation. Would like to take it further. So we'll welcome um, anyone who would like to make any contribution. To please um, use um, the raise your hand uh, function raise your hand function so that um, uh, I can I can I can um, recognize you and you can make your comments uh, so we have Kane de please uh, make your intervention and kindly follow the format um, the problem statement and the policy recommendation thank you very much Okay, good. Uh, good afternoon. Am I audible enough? Am I audible? Hello, am I audible? Can I hear you? Okay, thank you. So, uh, the the major problem we have is that uh, is, um, I'm away from the noise. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me better now? Can you hear me better now? Yes, but Hello? if you move away from the background noise, it will. Thank you. Okay, okay. I think there is no more noise now. So uh, the major challenge with uh, uh, with Nigeria and uh, West Africa is the uh, government repression of digital uh, digital rights. So um, my own solution would be that uh, uh, we need uh, the civil society need to be more alert because it's our. Um, control of freedom of speech is not just about uh, mainstream media anymore it's about digital media so we need to come together to uh, although unfortunately there is a divide uh, in the sense that a lot of people some people i don't know what this statistic is some people think that uh, it's okay to repress uh, social media to request uh, citizens' rights to be able to communicate uh, via whatever platform that they want. But whoever agrees that uh, what the government is doing is not right needs to put uh, more force together. We need to uh, come together with more uh, more uh, strategy to ensure that digital rights are respected and obeyed because. Uh, like what is happening in Nigeria presently uh, is like a template for other uh, African countries, especially the sub region. And we see it happen in, uh, even, uh, in Cameroon and all that. So we need to come together as soon as possible to advocate and show our disdain to this kind of repressive law. And like, uh, uh, as we mentioned, we need to also uh, come to the room, if we need to come to the room to discuss what exactly we need 
uh, even if there is going to be any form of uh, regulation or law that needs to be uh, mentioned uh, about the, to ensure that people don't misuse uh, digital rights, we need to come to the bedroom to be able to agree on that. But the most important thing is that we need to come together with enough force to be able to be recognized by the government that no, what you are doing is wrong and ensure that our rights are, are okay. Because uh, without doubt, a lot of uh, people have been denied access to information. But I just found on Twitter. So like I was at a meeting recently, uh, someone from government was just saying, just ban on Twitter. But they don't understand that even their media, the special assistance on, on social media, using Twitter more for communication, they just disenfranchise themselves too. It's not just ban on Twitter. It's a ban on the means of communication, of addressing issues. There is no platform that has ever existed for now on social media where you can take on any person in government and bring them into accountability like Twitter. So it's intentional. Why the government now shut down Twitter is intentional and they know what they are doing. So we need to arise and ensure that we speak out against this uh, uh, repression that is going on in Nigeria and possibly in other African countries. Thank you, I'm Kende Adebrega. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kende, for your thoughts and your inputs. Uh, so I am going to circle back um, just to get um, some of the last words from first, um, Verengai, second, um, Emmanuel, and um, from um, some of the lawyers that we have in the house here, specifically Buki, Ajilola, and Inina, uh, to, to, to get some of your closing remarks and perspective about what you think um, should happen um, or what the government should be doing, specifically when it comes to Twitter ban. I do have my own perspective while I'm following the case in court. Um, at least we are aware that some of those cases, uh, are, are, th th there is a current litigation in the ECOWAS court. Uh, but one of the arguments that the, the government is making is that we have not said Nigerians should not use Twitter. Right, and then it um, it becomes a very complex situation when they say we have not said Nigerians should not use Twitter yet. They have given um, the directive to um, the ISPs, the internet service providers, to block Twitter, uh, which shows that there is no sincerity of purpose. And I do take some keywords from uh, what um, Monica, Madam Monica, said about civil society becoming more active and participating actively on this space. Uh, but one of the key advice I'd like to also give uh, to civil society is that when you're going to the table or when you have an opportunity to go to the table to have this conversation, it's good that we don't become very aggressive. We don't try to poke uh, the government um, in their face by pointing to them that this is this, we should uh, perhaps have a more diplomatic way of approaching some of these issues with the government um, these are spanning from some of our own experience from the Internet Society Nigerian chapter on how we try to engage with the government, especially when it comes to issues surrounding this Twitter ban. Um, uh, but before I circle, uh, while I'm going to circle back to uh, Verengai for some of his closing remarks and um, um, Emmanuel, um, let me quickly, first of all, welcome uh, Verengai to, to give some of his last thoughts on that. Hello, Verengai. Are you still online? Okay, while we wait for Verengai, Emmanuel, could you please share your last thoughts on um, the Twitter ban and what you think? And let's try and break it down to the non research um, perspective so that the end user in, on the street can understand um, the interpretations of the research. Thank you, Caleb. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, yeah. So the Twitter ban in Nigeria, much has already been said. Um, I think that um, just to add to what the what has already been said, um, Twitter is 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 a platform that um, Nigerians use for many purposes. 
uh, aside the aside the most popular being um, um, economic purposes um, for selling and buying products. I, for one, have taken courses on Twitter, um, you know, um, through open interactions with um, some experts, and they have, um, you know, hosted courses, short um, engagement courses, and I'm sure that many Nigerians also use um, Twitter for other various purposes, entertainment, information. And um, to, to, to put a ban on Twitter um, at this time, you know, under various um, prevaricating um, purposes, okay, the, the, the government began with saying that Twitter is, is not paying taxes in Nigeria. It began with saying that Twitter is um, undermining corporate and collective interests in Nigeria. You know, we, we have had so many pro propositions. I think what the end user on the street needs to know is first, you know, what, what, what's my role in all of this? What's my role in all of this? How, how do I fit into the framework of this discussion that is emerging? Um, you know, to, to in, in, in my experience, I have seen that to keep quiet to issues like this because they have not gotten to you yet or, or because you cannot identify with them yet, is gonna to translate to a situation where by the time it gets to you, the issue would have gotten so bad that everyone would have either gotten so frustrated talking about it because nothing has been done. When your voice may have been, you know, um, may have helped to amplify the collective positions of of everyone else, and and and, and this takes us back to um, what what some of the speakers have, have shared today. You know, we 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 need a we need a grassroots, bottom up, coordinated approach to advocacy. You know, the, the the end user on the street needs to understand what this what are the implications of these things for him or her. You know, beyond the beyond the broader you know, what's, what's going on in Nigeria and, and how does it affect diplomacy and international relations? How does it affect me on the street? How does it affect me in the classroom as a student? How does it affect me, you know, as, as a free Nigerian or as a Nigerian who wants to live in a free country? You know, speaking rights, democratic rights, freedom of speech, you know, freedom of um, association and, 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 and the freedom to share and engage, you know, beyond, beyond, the, beyond the frontiers of, of, of the digital realm. More importantly, um, like um, Nina also mentioned, rights are rights are interrelated, and you know when it begins to affect one, and you think that okay, the the others are protected. At the end of the day, you might see that you might have none to 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 lay hold on. At the end, you know when 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 the rubber meets the road, because from the digital space, we have begun to see that rights that have been undermined in the digital space are beginning to translate into the physical space. And we have seen in countries like Myanmar, we have seen in countries like Hong Kong, we have seen in countries like Mali and Cameroon, even in Uganda, you know, um, at, at, at the moment, we have seen how, 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 the, how the authoritarian excesses of governments across both the digital and virtual um, and physical spaces are beginning to unite to create a force that is undermining democracy on a broad scale. So I think for the user on the street, what you need to know is at the end of the day, how does this issue affect me? How or what's my role in all of this? Um, <clears throat> and it's on that basis that you'll be able to find yourself, you know, involved in the broader discussions that are needed to generate the impact that we need. Those are my last thoughts. Thank you, Caleb. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Um, so we'd like to circle back to um, Verengai if you are still available online. And um, while we are waiting for Ver Verengai, are you online? Um, so while we are going to circle back to Verengai, um, let me quickly um, allow Mohamed Kamara to just share his line of thought as um, we are almost, um, we are expected to close the session in a few minutes time. Mohamed Kamara, would you like to share your thoughts? Okay, so um, it doesn't seem like he is also online as well. Um, so um, I'd like to hear last thoughts from, um, let's just make it one from one of, um, one from Ajilola and one from uh, Puki, just one minute thought, and one from Inena, just to close the session at the top of the hour. Your last thoughts. Would you like me to go first? Yes, please do. Okay. 
basically, I think that we must continue to seek ways to encourage our legislators, our National Assembly people to practice democracy in the real sense of it, uh, especially in terms of the separation of powers, um, trying to ensure that the, we encourage them to see the impact of some of these um, draft legislations on their own communities. Because at the end of the day, um, it is their relationship with their communities that drives their thinking. And so we really have to ensure that we, we get them to understand that at the end of the day, they will suffer if the wrong legislation is in place. Uh, they need to, we need to encourage them to have a longer term view, a broader view, and not just a narrow view of uh, what they want to achieve you know, uh, in the short term. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ajlala. Um, over to you, Inena. Um, thank you. Um, just in conclusion, I just want to emphasize again what I had said in the beginning, that indeed it is possible for states to limit social media use. But what is so ridiculous in this situation is you particularly picked out a social media platform, and I worry that it will lead to other bans in other, um, on other platforms as well. Um, if we are worried about national security, which is the case, what the government is saying, you know, because of conflict situations and the fact that use of Twitter has led to escalation of tensions and they're trying to prevent conflict, I think we should pursue it the right way. Um, the new national cybersecurity strategy, which impressively was headed by Abdul Hakim, sets out a very right strategy. And I think that Nigeria should pursue cybersecurity, the right approach. Um, Emmanuel's presentation at the end, he talked about technical infrastructure. We lack all of that. Can we build our infrastructure? Can we create the appropriate environment? Can we look at international cooperation and learn the best practices? Bukola lined out what happens in the UK. Let's learn the best um, practices going forward. Beyond that as well, there is no better time to discuss, and I'm saying this, Caleb, because you're here, to discuss a digital rights act. Let's set an example. I would also ask that as Nigeria goes forward in legislation, going back to what Abdul Hakim has said, we need to involve stakeholders. It is embarrassing that Nigeria will make laws, it goes to the ECOWAS court and they tell them to repeal a law and you find that that happens because there was no adequate consultation in the first place with stakeholders that would actually give the right advice. So while we make policies going forward, let's involve all stakeholders. I still say that the ban, for, uh, the ban of Twitter is distorted. It is actually arbitrary, and I worry that it will give powers beyond where people should actually have powers, thinking about police beginning to check people for use of Twitter. So um, I think briefly, that's just um, what I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Kola Faturoti, your line of thoughts. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I will not want to sound like a broken record or just to repeat what my colleagues have said unnecessarily. Uh, you see, when we're having this conversation, uh, it is difficult not being partisan about it or being political. Uh, if you look at the current government that is trying to shut down Twitter, they actually rode on these social uh, platforms when they were contesting. They used this extensively. So were they thinking that, okay, now we're in power and we're not going to go out again? No, the only thing that is permanent is change itself. Do everybody want to remain in power? But do you, uh, one point I will just make, which uh, my both colleagues mentioned, is people's participation. We have a constitution that says, we the people. I never remember being consulted. And if you could actually debate a uh, petroleum uh, industry bill extensively, maybe because money is there, but however, that platform which helps people to speak you can, as in you can imagine the way all of us in Nigeria, how we've integrated this thing into our lives. And if we allow the government to take Twitter away, it's just like handshake, which will go beyond elbow one day. So in a nutshell, they should consult people before making any law in this regard. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we are at the top of the hour when we are expected to close. So um, 
I would like to quickly round up as your moderator. My name is Caleb Ogundele, um, President of the um, Internet Society Nigerian Chapter. And um, we will want to thank you all for coming for this great session. Um, on behalf of um, Mabika, who is um, the um, host of this session, and um, I'd like to share some of my appreciation on his behalf. And thank you all for coming. However, I'd like to leave this uh, parting words to you in the words of the great philosopher. If we all fail to participate in politics, which include um, drafting legislation, participating in everything that um, needs to do with our daily lives, we will end up being governed by imbeciles. So in order not to be governed by imbeciles, um, we would want to encourage you to participate actively in any conversation that you see that pertains to your digital rights and things that will affect you not being online to have your freedom as well. So on this note, um, I'd like to close by saying thank you very much. Um, yours truly, Caleb Ogundele, wish you all um, a happy time and happy um, week ahead of you. Thank you very much and have a great day. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Good session and you did very well. Thank you all the speakers. Thank you the organizers. We expect you to join us tomorrow. We still have um, two sessions or three sessions to do tomorrow. Please join us tomorrow. Dr. Oh. Bukola, hope to yeah. see you tomorrow. Thank you everybody. Yeah. It's a pleasure being part of this. Thank you. One more thing. Can, can we all activate our videos so that we can have a photo smile um from everyone just activate your video let's see how beautiful your face looks like today some of us we have dreadlocks you know that uh don't worry we will photoshop that <laughs> so are we ready so everybody have a smile cheese one Just one more. I hope you are holding down that smile. One more, slide two. Yeah, I see a lot of people doing thumbs up. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for making this session a very great one and interactive. Um, see you at the session tomorrow and please have a great day. Thank you. You can be my friend. We care for each other. Oh,